Good afternoon, everybody. We'll give it just about uh, two or three minutes. Uh, see, or since we're right at the two o'clock, but we'll try to start on time. Um, and uh, I don't know, Keith, that we got our uh, official in from the University Medical Center yet. I don't see her. Her name is Jessica Snowden, Dr. Snowden. Okay. Will be the one. So let me reach out to her. There's uh, Dr. Patterson's office right now and coming in on the, the uh, request to get in. There's Dr. Patterson himself. So thank you, Dr. Patterson, for joining us. Happy to be here. And uh, he's coming he, in now. Yeah, yeah, I just saw Miss Snowden too. Great, Doctor Snowden. Okay, I know that uh, Doctor McGee will probably be letting others in. Um, but we want to first off thank all of you for taking time today. Um, Doctor Snowden and Doctor Patterson, if it's okay, we'd like to. Uh, take this just in case there's some that, that would like to share this within their own district, or maybe there are some schools within the Pulaski County region who weren't able to get on. We know they're not on, but we're going to share it with other folks. Um, for all who are on this, this Zoom, uh, first off, I do want to welcome you and, and wish you good afternoon. This actually started about two years ago. Now, initially, uh, we had charter schools meeting with the public schools, and that was a pretty big deal. And then we had the Little Rock School District district meeting with private schools, and that was a pretty big deal. And then we had charters, private, and public schools all meeting together because we all have the same purpose, okay? We all just wanna have great things happening for kids. So this collective thing that's happened really over a two year span some of you may be new to that, but we've actually had kind of some conversations and we've been interacting and we've been sharing uh, because really, again, if we do something well and we can share it, it's going to make our whole community better. It's going to improve the lives of kids. And that's what we're all about in the end run. So um, one of the things before we kind of turn it over to Dr. McGee to set the stage with the University Medical Center is that I do uh, want us to give thought about, you know, at some point us having another Zoom, maybe not generated towards um, everything going on with the pandemic, but more towards some of the other areas that we previously talked about, like uh, college recruiting fairs that we can all, you know, open up to each other. Uh, some other things that we've done, like with the Imagination Library to get books into the hands of pre-K babies that anybody in this whole community can have access to. Um, so kind of some collective efforts that we can maybe come back to uh, we, when we get the chance. Today is probably not the day where we're gonna get to introduce um, some of the new folks. We have new folks, uh, whether it's at uh, North Little Rock, uh, the new superintendent there has never really got to take part in this. I've noticed we've got uh, somebody from Pulaski Academy and, and, uh, and we appreciate you being here. And that's a new phase. So, Today just isn't quite that thing because I want to honor the time of uh, Dr. Snowden and Dr. Patterson uh, and, and, and just so appreciate that. Now, I want to thank uh, Dr. McGee, who, you know, I, I want you all to know that I'm, I, even though I talk about collaboration, I'm very willing to steal your best people like I did with North Little Rock and uh, get Dr. McGee over to me. But um, we, we're, we're appreciative we got Dr. McGee in. Keep, keep, Greg muted, okay, so he can't talk on this, but uh, we, we are glad that uh, we've got Dr. McGee in Little Rock, and he helped engineer this, so Dr. McGee, will you just kind of set up the stage so that then it can be uh, turned over to Dr. Patterson and, and Dr. Snowden? Yes, thank you, Superintendent, uh, and thank you, everybody, and Dr. Patterson and Dr. Snowden for taking time to come out and to share with us. Uh, we kind of wanted to come as a unit and just to hear from 
uh, from the medical professions, uh, not only about the Delta variants, but the, uh, the, po <clears throat> the positive things about vaccines, and then also just kind of give us some recommendations going forward so that we can continue to share out with our communities as we get ready to reopen schools. So that was our goal. And I wanna thank our point of contact committee led by our nurse McEwen and Mr. Self uh, that assisted me in making sure that we can come and set the stage for this so that we can push out to our community the correct information as we look not only to increase vaccination, but also to share the facts uh, about this variant. So that's the stage we wanna set. I know that just uh, Dr. Snowden, you're gonna have a presentation with some slides. I wanted to let you present and let Dr. Patterson come after you present, then maybe we can do kind of a quick questioning, uh, several questions, then uh, we're gonna honor our time and then we'll try to, those questions we can put in the chat, we can print off and then we can maybe share uh, and get those questions answered and shared with the whole uh, Pulaski County Networking Committee team here. So let me turn it over to Dr. Patterson and then Dr. Snowden, and then we'll go from there. We do ask that if you're not speaking, uh, that you keep your microphone muted so that we can give honor to those who are presenting. Dr. Patterson. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, uh, Dr. McGee, uh, Mr. Poor, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I will provide some high level remarks uh, that are generally applicable to COVID-19 in the state of Arkansas. And, and then I'll, I'll turn things over to Jessica um, uh, because she knows an awful lot more about uh, the uh, patient populations that you are most uh, concerned about and interested in. Um, we, as you all know, are in our third surge of COVID-19. Um, we uh, are seeing an increased number of patients admitted with complications of COVID-19 across the state. The northern part of our state is a hot spot, but I can tell you that the healthcare facilities in uh, central Arkansas are extremely stretched right now. Uh, we currently have about 60 patients at UAMS who are admitted with complications of COVID-19. Um, that's up from a low of single digits in the um, uh, April-May timeframe. So uh, this is a, a substantial burden to all of us. Um, we are seeing a shift in the patients who are being admitted though. During, uh, during the first wave of COVID-19, the average age of an individual who's admitted to the hospital here at UAMS with COVID-19 was in the mid 60s. Um, currently, the average age of patients admitted to UAMS with COVID-19 complications is 40. Um, we are seeing uh, a significant number of pregnant individuals who are admitted with COVID-19. Um, we uh, unfortunately have um, uh, lost at least one baby to a mom who was pregnant and developed COVID-19. Um, uh, patients who are being admitted are sicker. We have a higher proportion of patients who are in our ICUs, uh, higher proportion requiring mechanical ventilation. Uh, and currently, right now, we have five patients with COVID-19 who are on heart-lung bypass to keep them alive. So uh, the difference in COVID-19 now compared to a year ago, patients are younger um, and patients are definitely sicker. Uh, and Jessica can, can speak to the impact in pediatric communities. Uh, what is driving this change? Well, the main thing that is driving this change is the Delta variant. Uh, we identified the first, uh, the first presence of the Delta variant here in Arkansas on May the 1st. Um, by the second half of June, it was the dominant variant, and it's essentially the only variant that is circulating right now in the state of Arkansas. Uh, it is uh, about twice as contagious as the original strains of COVID-19, uh, and it definitely has uh, uh, more virulence uh, and causes more problems than COVID-19 does. Um, what uh, are we doing to, um, to address this issue? 
Well, part of the story is vaccination, but only 35% of the people of Arkansas right now are currently vaccinated. We need to be north of 70% um, to get to a, a point where uh, any form of herd immunity uh, will, will start having an impact on spread of the virus. Uh, uh, and to put all of this in perspective, last Friday, we were all very excited to see that 10,000 doses of the vaccine were administered. That was an uptick from where we were running the previous couple of weeks. But even still, if we did 10,000 uh, vaccines a day, it would take us 200 days to get to 70% of all our Kansans being vaccinated. Um, so this means that, you know, unless uh, uh, vaccination trends substantially increase above where they are, uh, we're in for a long period of time before we even get close to a point where the vaccine is going to have a substantial impact. Uh, masking and social distancing continue to be important tools for us. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID fatigue uh, and the um, recension of the mask mandates, uh, we don't see the utilization of masks um, that um, we, we did when the mandate was in place. Um, and that's clearly driving an awful lot of the uh, dissemination of, of COVID-19 in our state. So I, I'll pause there with just some broad level, um, broad high level uh, comments about COVID-19. Um, and I think Jessica can, can drill down into some aspects of the pandemic that are particularly pertinent to um, uh, the in-person school uh, context. So Jessica, take it away. Thank you very much. And um, Dr. McGee had asked me to kind of make a couple of slides to talk to you guys about Delta variant and things like that. And the other thing I will tell you, so not only am I pediatric infectious disease division chief here at the Children's Hospital, which means I am just came off of service today. I have 13 kids in my hospital with COVID-19, seven in the ICU and three on the ventilator. So as someone who's looking at school starting in a month, knowing that we are seeing that in the lab, and I can't describe to you the change in the last few weeks and what we have seen show up in sick kids here in our hospital. But importantly for all of you, I'm also the mom of a fifth grader who is going to start fifth grade at one of your schools in a month. And so it's, there are a lot of things that influence all of our concern about this and particularly when we see what's happening here. The Delta variant, I will tell you, um, showed up in children at the same time we saw it in adults. So we are sequencing all of our COVID-19 variants here at the Children's Hospital. My wonderful colleague, Dr. Josh Kennedy, is able to get all those sequenced for us. And we saw it show up in May. And when we looked at our data for May, it showed up here in kids at the beginning of May. And by the end of May, it was 20% of our samples. By the end of June, it was 70% of our samples. And now it's almost everything. It is so much more contagious. And what we're seeing is not necessarily that children are per se more susceptible to it than it, they were the others. It's just because it is so much more contagious and everyone around them is taking their masks off. Now we are seeing kids get sick and they can't protect themselves unless we protect them. So when we talk about what COVID variants are, there are a few different categories, but the one we're most worried about are what we call variants of concern. And you've kind of heard that phrase used on the news. Those are the ones that we're currently watching and characterizing. And the reason we care about them is because like the Delta variant, we're seeing them widespread, but also we know that they're more transmissible. So when we looked at original COVID, right, the original strains that we first saw back a year and a half ago now, one person would potentially infect up to two other people. And even that was pretty infectious. That's much more infectious than what we see for other things. For the Delta variant, one person is infecting five to eight people. And the data that we have is showing that it takes less time and less exposure. So if you think about, oh, say, a hallway full of high school students who are changing classes or going to their lockers who are unvaccinated, one person who has the Delta variant is going to take out a large swath of your high school. We also know that it is not just more transmissible, but the treatments I have don't work as well. So one of the things that we had to change fairly quickly when the Delta variant showed up 
is I had several things that I was able to use to keep you from getting sick that no longer work. And we had to revise all of our treatment pathways to pull them out. I have a couple of things I can still give you. I can, there are still things I can do, but my arm inventarium is getting smaller and smaller. So what we have to do is keep this out of circulation. The other important piece of this to keep in mind is that the variants are not stopping. So when we looked at what all the variants were, right, we started with the alpha variant. That was the one in the UK during their surge. It was 50% more transmissible than what we had seen before. Then we had the South African variant, which is the beta variant, and the delta variant in India, which is what we're dealing with now. The gamma variant has arisen in Japan and Brazil. We've got an epsilon variant. We've got a lambda variant. The first person in Texas got sick with the lambda variant last, this week. Every one of these is going to get more transmissible and more severe because that's how it survives. The more we spread the virus, the more it changes. So we're never going to get to herd immunity because it's going to continue to change. We have got to stop spreading the virus amongst ourselves because it, this is just going to continue to happen. The Delta variant in particular, much more transmissible. There are mixed reports as to if it's more severe, but I will tell you our impression clinically is the same as CAMS. Kids are sicker. And particularly what we're seeing is that they're coming in unable to breathe. And every single one of them, I stand with their parents and explain to them what I can and can't do and what I do and don't know. And every single one of them wish they had vaccinated their kid because all of them so far have been incompletely vaccinated, either because they were too young or because they hadn't gotten around to it yet. We know that two doses of the Pfizer vaccine is still very, very effective against the Delta variant. If you get two doses, you get 88% infection or 88% protection. That means that you're much less likely to get sick. And even if you do get sick, you're gonna get mildly ill. So I have a colleague who texted me just a little while ago this morning, her husband who is vaccinated, got sick with COVID-19. He was sick for 24 hours and is now better. We also know that people who are vaccinated don't shed as much virus. So if you are a vaccinated adult or a vaccinated teenager and you get infected with Delta because it is very contagious and so you might, not only are you not gonna get very sick, you're much less likely to infect someone else. So we wanna make sure that we're encouraging vaccines as much as possible, even though we're, it's gonna keep us from going through this again. So the best way to protect kids under 12, which is what most of us are dealing with, is to vaccinate and mask everybody around them. When we think about what it means, I really enjoyed that Dr. McGee's question was, tell us how to start school. <laughs> That's only a you know, small question, right, to answer. But when we think about this, it really is about multiple layers of protection. And I think I've been asked the question about starting school 10 times a day for the last week by all kinds of people, both because I'm a pediatrician and because I'm a mom. And because I think we're all frustrated by some boundaries that are put in place for us, right? We're not going to be able to, unless there's a change, mandate masking. It's not gonna be a rule. So then how do we get kids back in the classroom? where we all know as pediatricians, as parents, as educators, we all know that's where they need to be. So figuring out how to do that in a way that's safe for them and that's safe for their school teachers and their staff is gonna be critical and it's gonna require lots of different things that are going forward. So what the AAP and CDC recommendations are saying is masking for children over two years of age. Now there is a difference between the AAP and the CDC on this. So the CDC says masking for everybody who is unvaccinated which would mean everybody under 12 and then some of the 12 year olds, 12 and ups who could be vaccinated but aren't. What the AAP says, and I would definitely recommend the AAP approach for this is masking for everyone because logistically, how are you going to know who in that hallway full of 12 year olds is vaccinated and who isn't? It's logistically going to be impossible for schools to manage sorting out masking someone who's unvaccinated versus mask, not letting somebody who's, who is vaccinated. That's not going to be a thing you're going to be able to sort out in any realistic way. And with the breakthrough infections we're seeing with Delta, it's not going to help us end the pandemic. We're still going to maintain three foot distance. We're still going to avoid hall, crowding in the hallways and the lunchroom. So all the things that we thought about last fall when things were bad and during the winter when things were bad, like having one way arrows in the hall, like having people change classes in staggered shifts, like avoiding the use of lockers. All those things that lead to crowding are things we need to continue to avoid. 
especially right now. When the Delta surge settles down, this is something we'll revisit, right? This is a moving target all the time. But right now, given how much community transmissibility we have and how low our vaccination rate is, we've got to continue to avoid crowding. Lunch rooms are a particular place that can get crowded and get busy. We probably will need to still have kids eating lunch in their classrooms or eating lunch outside because we know that being outside is safer. We want to maximize outdoor activities and ventilation. Anything that is projecting your voice loudly, like choir, like cheerleading, like a play, needs to be outside. It's going to be much, much safer if we're outside than inside. And really encouraging people to avoid presenteeism. This is actually the time when the perfect attendance award is a really bad thing. You need to stay home if you're sick. And we need to make sure we are encouraging people to remember that. So the question I think for all of us is how do you actually do this? When you can't mandate it, how are all of us going to make sure that our parents are on board, our parents and our team members are all on board with maintaining the same kind of guidance we had last year because we know that's the safest thing to do and we know our kids are still in danger when you're not gonna have the backup of a mandate to help you. And so I think today that's probably the conversation we need to have and I'm happy to answer any questions about what we need, what we can give you, what we can help you with to make this easier. Because this is what we need to do to keep people safe. So how are we going to make it happen? And with that, I'll stop for any questions. Dr. McGee, and we can spend the rest of the time talking. Thank you. Uh, the best way I think we need to do this, if you can put your questions in the chat, uh, Superintendent, I would like, Superintendent Poor, I'd like for all of the superintendents that's represented to maybe ask any questions from their perspective district and the rest of the question we can put them in the chat then we can be able to uh kind of ask at jessica ask you those questions and i'm gonna ask uh, miss pamela smith to help me assist in the chat with those questions so that we can uh, ask so thank you for that question if you have any questions with North Little Rock, and I know that Pulaski Academy is here, um, then maybe see if with, with anything that you specifically would like to ask Dr. Patterson or Dr. Snow. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. And Mr. Poor, thank you and Dr. McGee for setting this up. And, uh, you know, this is on everybody's mind. <clears throat> you know, my inbox is getting filled with parents um, concerned daily as well as I am. And, and, and I think I think that million dollar question is, is just the mask. I mean, we know that, that that protects children, but yet we're with not being able to mandate that and, and trying to get everybody on board um, is, is certainly a challenge I think that we're all dealing with and, and how we're gonna approach that of you know, encouraging our staff. I think to me, that's the, that's the big thing. I mean, obviously we're, um, that's the only change that we plan on. We, all of our process procedures have to be in place. We're still in a pandemic, obviously, uh, but but that one <laughs> component that we know will save lives and protect the spreading. Uh, obviously, encouraging all of our uh, employees to get vaccinated. We we're still not there. We're still not at seventy five percent, even in our own school district. We're just a little over fifty percent. So we're trying to think of ways of of incentives. I know similar to what Mr. Poor is doing and Dr. McGee over in Little Rock about you know, trying to get incentives for shots, uh, COVID leave, those kinds of things. But I think for us, it's, you know, how do we deal with the, the mass component when it can't be, you know, I don't have any teeth to say to my folks, I'm gonna make you, I have to make you do this. So I, I think that's what we're, one of the things, I, we're all struggling with that, I think. Well, and I think that's one of the things where it's really important that you guys are all doing this together because I think that's the only way it's gonna work because if we can't mandate it, then what we have to do is establish that this is the culture of safety, that it's more normal to be masked than not to be masked, that everything you see when you go in school and every communication that you get that you're as a parent um, is saying, we are encouraging masking. We are recommending masking, not even, I wouldn't say encourage, I would say recommend. We are recommending masking for everybody who is coming in and making sure that we have got oodles of patient-friendly, parent-friendly materials. One of the things that is coming from the Children's Hospital, actually, is we have a, like a pamphlet thing that you guys are going to get. 
that talks about the questions we get asked about the vaccine and about masking all the time and has links to data for people who can go and look and see, here's the data that masking works. Here's the data that masking is safe. Here's, I frequently <laughs> answer questions about, you know, wackadoo papers that people are quoting saying, oh, I'm seeing this paper from my parents saying that we shouldn't be masking because it raises CO2 levels. I have a whole file full of things that I can help you refute that with <laughs> because I send them out all the time to people. But I think the key to this, it's culture change. Right? And so culture change means that at every single level of leadership, we have the same message, which is we are recommending masks because we want to protect your children. It's our job to protect your children, and this is what we're going to do. And it's not that that's going to be easy. It is going, it is culture change is always a continual effort. But I think the more the entire county is on the same page with that regard, the better, because I am getting text messages all the time from people who are changing their kids from one school to the other because it's not masking um, and wondering about, have you heard what this school is doing because I'm not sure what mine's gonna do and whether I need to move my kid around. Parents talk to each other, therefore the more we're all on the same page, the easier it is for all of you to stand up together and say, this is how we protect kids, this is what we're gonna do. And whatever tools we can give you to help I know, like I so said, we here at Children's, we're developing things. I'm very sure Cam is on board with UAMS helping with whatever you need to do to be able to help you guys support the messaging that masking is what's gonna keep kids safe until this is over. And Cam, I don't know if you have other ideas for how we can support them in this. Uh, I think Jessica hit the nail on the head. You know, I, I think the other thing to think about is, um, you know, I, I think saying that masks are recommended is, um, uh, you know, uh, a, a wise way of phrasing things, given what we can and can't say. Um, uh, but you can also think of ways in which you can um, uh, softly incentivize uh, kids and parents to, to do the right thing. And, and you know more about how to do this than, than I would, but are there certain areas that only kids who have a mask uh, are safe to access? Can, can you give kids who are wearing masks permission to do things? that kids with, with masks uh, may not have permission to do. Um, our, our employees at UAMS have to fill out a survey when um, they come into work each day. Uh, we still have 12% of our uh, uh, employees who have not been vaccinated. They have to fill out a much longer survey than the employees who have been vaccinated. So, you know, I would encourage you to think about ways in which you can make it more convenient for uh, a kid to um, be wearing a mask. Um, and you know, that's not a mandate uh, and it doesn't, um, uh, you know, it doesn't violate anything that the, the state legislature wanted to happen in the legislative session that we just went through. Um, and it, it might be a way to, to help to ensure that kids feel that wearing a mask is, is to their own benefit while they're at school. I think one of the pieces to leverage as well are leverage your vocal parents because the vocal minority voices are going to be there. So look out for who are the parents that you can leverage in your PTA, in your classrooms, who can help amplify this message. So it's not coming just from you guys or just from us, but also coming from other parents in the school system so that we know that it's consistent and we know that it's for everything, you know, there, there's a really important factor of norming that goes along with things. And so having people who are speaking up for masking and for protecting kids, instead of just always hearing the misinformation pieces is gonna be really important to help people feel like they're doing the right thing. Jessica, here's a question in the chat from uh, Catholic High School, Matthew Dipsy. Other than shooting for 100% vaccination, what's a good goal to be safe? That's an excellent question. And by the way, I heard this morning that the Catholic schools are requiring masks, so good for you. Um, Joe Thompson said that on TV this morning with, um, when he and I were on PBS. Um, so we don't know, essentially. We don't know what a good answer is because that number depends on how transmissible things are. So when we look at things like measles, and the Delta variant is about measles level. I have to have greater than 95% vaccine coverage to avoid an outbreak. But we don't know exactly what that's gonna look like for COVID because it's transmitted differently. 
So we don't know a good number. I can tell you that, you know, when we looked at setting our kind of tiered incentives um, here within the children's hospital system, and I'm, I think probably the same at UAMS, we look at where we are and where we want to be, which is 100%, and then try to figure out what steps along the way feel like meaningful change. But it's, it's hard to know what the, the actual number is. I wish I had a better answer for that. And another question coming from Pulaski Academy. Are there any chances of the CDC and the AAP getting on the same page? Um, I hope so. I've heard rumblings that the Delta variant is causing some new discussions at the CDC. And because now it's not just us in Missouri, right? Louisiana is now also the dark purple maroon color. Um, so we are seeing more of this through the South. And I think the conversation is shifting nationally to COVID is over because for many parts of the country where vaccine uptake has been better, they are getting back to normal. Um, so the fact that we are experiencing such surging with the Delta variant is causing some reconsideration. And I have heard rumblings that the CDC is going to change their language to get more in line with. I mean, when you read both of them, they're not really that different except for that vaccine quirk. Um, but it is definitely something that we're hoping will get easier for all of you as schools if everybody's on the same page. Jessica, here's another question from our, uh, one of our co-point of contact uh, chair, Jessica McEwen. With more students coming back on campus, do you have any suggestions for protecting kids and staff in our classroom besides three feet spacing and recommending masks? I think the other things to think about are the things that you were doing last year, like opening windows or thinking about what your ventilation looks like in the room, thinking about moving teachers around instead of moving students around, thinking about what the cleaning practices are in the workspaces that they're going to be in. All of those things we were doing before are going to be important to continue now, I think, particularly as we think about how people move around. And so I can remember at our school going, everybody being very excited and we could go from the teachers moving around to the students moving around, right? We probably need to stick with the teacher moving around now so that we're avoiding all that movement. We're keeping people cohorted and we're keeping people from crowding the hallways. But anything you can do to avoid a mass of people and be in a space where there's a window open or outside is going to be better. I, I would agree with that. I, I was, so one other thing that I, I would, think about adding is um, stressing the importance that everyone in families who can be vaccinated should be vaccinated. So even if kids under 12 um, can't be vaccinated, if everyone in their family is vaccinated, they're far less likely to bring COVID-19 into the school setting. Absolutely, I think that's one of the things as we look at messaging around masking, Messaging around vaccination is going to be just as important. One of the questions in the chat um, from Catholic High is that their students are around 70% vaccinated and teachers are 98%, which is amazing and fantastic. And so that really can impact your approach because you've got a highly vaccinated population, you're less likely to see outbreaks on your campus. And so it may be a place where with, as your vaccination rate continues to rise, your students do get more freedom of movement at the high school level than the rest of ours do. And it's safer for your group to have not a mask mandate in high school because there is so much better. Um, so the other questions are about children five to 12. And as the mom of an almost 10 year old, I am watching that very closely. So what they had originally projected, they have finished enrollment of the, it's about 5,000 kids all over the country who've been enrolled in the Pfizer trial for ages six to 12. They have finished enrollment of that. They're gonna have their two month data, which if you'll remember what we got the adult emergency authorization for was based on two month data. They will have that two month data in mid August. The FDA has asked for four to six months before they would authorize a vaccine for children under 12. Again, because of the perception that children are less at risk and Delta may change that, that thinking a little bit. Um, but if they go to four to six months, that means we're looking at mid October to mid-December when we have the safety data, the long-term safety data and efficacy data in kids, which would mean late winter, um, late 2021, early 2022 is when we're anticipating being able to vaccinate kids less than 12. 
They haven't finished enrolling all of the cohort of kids who are under six, so that one will be even further out. But six to 12 year olds, I'm hoping is before the end of 2021. Um, but we will see what that looks like. Certainly everything I have heard so far from a, so as a clinical trialist, I know a lot of people who are doing these studies and there's nothing that anybody is reporting that is concerning from a side effect profile. So I think we're gonna see very similar safety profile for kids as we saw for adults, which is gonna be fantastic and really helpful in getting us back to normal. Jessica, I think that is all the questions I see in the chat. Um, we want to continue on our time. I know we set aside an hour. I'm going to turn it back over to our superintendent. If there's no other questions, um, then uh, this was very helpful to us. So well, we really certainly appreciate uh, both Jessica and Dr. Patterson, both Dr. Patterson and Dr. Snowden for taking time to come out and share this information with us. So I'm going to turn it back over to our superintendent and thank you so much. Reach out if you need anything. We are always happy to help. Just email and we'll share. Happy to help. Bye. Thanks for the invite. Hi, guys. Thank you again, uh, both of you. We really appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. McGee, can you push it back out to let us see uh, more off the presentation right now? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, one thing that, that I will share with you that's kind of uh, not necessarily emerging news, but you're probably all aware of the lawsuits that are developing you're probably aware that the Pulaski County Legislative Group has put in to say that they would like the state legislators to reconsider. This this afternoon, I was made aware of a, a, for lack of a better word, a demonstration that will occur Tuesday at two o'clock, Tuesday at, at two um, on the Capitol steps. The interesting group about this is what I've been told is that it's gonna be a mix of Republicans and Democrats. It's gonna be Dr. Thompson uh, that you heard mentioned earlier um, in these presentations. I am personally gonna speak at that um, and, and share that I really believe that the legislative group needs to reconsider to allow local entities to make the decisions. I, I think our county's in a little bit different place than a lot of others. Uh, I know we get pressures kind of on both ends, but you know, compared to our colleagues in the Northwest or the, the South, uh, they're, they're just totally uh, freaking out about any kind of even bringing up the word mask mandate. And, and I don't sense that from our own group. So I don't know whether anybody wants to be there. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to say uh, like, you know, and I'm just picking a couple examples that, you know, if Pulaski County School District or Lisa Academy, since I haven't mentioned them <coughs> uh, previously, <coughs> were to say, hey, Mike, it's okay to say I'm a school district behind it. And so if we had, you know, 10 of you as school districts, uh, as, as entity school organizations say, we're, we want this to happen to give us the choice. I could demonstrate that and say that in my speech. I, I don't want to put pressure on it. And I don't really want to say it to say, well, East M said yes, Lisa said no, and Pulaski Academy said yes, and uh, 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 what's another, uh, uh, Baptist said that they didn't want, you know, I don't want to pit people and have it then become a political thing. I just want to give a large number and just say, hey, out of all of our schools that, that we meet as a collective group, you know, we have um, 10 schools, that, schools, school districts that said they're in favor of making this a local control issue. So, I, again, I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Some of you may need to talk to your board of directors about that. But all you have to do is simply email me or text me to say you can count me in. And again, I won't say that Lisa Academy is in. I'll just mention the grand total of schools that are saying they would like to see local control from the Central Arkansas group, if that makes sense. So everybody would need to follow up with me on that. Um, and, and my plan is to uh, to be on the steps on, on Tuesday and uh, share it. Any, anything else for the good of the order? First on just the pandemic um, and, you know, kind of some of our reactions or 
actions that we're going to take <coughs> or um, any questions that any one of, any one of us want to ask each other. Mike, I'll just jump in. I, <clears throat> I want to, you know, count me in, count North Little Rock in with you, uh, a part of that to continue to advocate um, for a little local control to uh, count us in. Thank you. Mike, can I ask a question just of kind of the other superintendents and school leaders? I know we can't do a, you know, a, a listing or ask, you know, whether it's staff or students, if they've been vaccinated, do you all have ways that you all are getting that information? Just so you have, I know, I mean, obviously if you pay a bonus to staff members to be vaccinated, you know who got vaccinated. But in terms of really students, you know, just so that you get some sense of where you stand, I mean, how are you all getting to that kind of information to know what percentage of your of people in your buildings maybe have been vaccinated? Ron, do you want to start for us? Um, I can. Um, uh, so voluntarily, they give up the data, but most of our data, to be honest with you, came from us vaccinating them on our campuses. Uh, so they signed up to be vaccinated on our campus. And so we were able to collect that data and get it. So I could, what we can do is we give you up to a certain amount. Cause so we're probably at about, I know for a fact that we're at about 73% vaccinated. What I don't, there are some unknowns. I would say that we're probably close to 80 or more, but those that we don't know right now is where we're at. So that's where we get most of our data. We are going to offer the bonus, so we will get a little more hard data there too. This is Luann Baroni with Lisa Academy. Uh, we also did on-campus vaccination clinics, which gave us a pretty good read on who got it through that. And we're also doing the bonus, which will help us identify. So those are the methods that we've used so far. Okay, I, I think that was a dramatic enough pause or gap. Uh, just uh, next is, you know, and this could just be a wave of hands or whatever, but, uh, you know, this whole, you know, group of us coming together, a collective, uh, is it a value to bring us together in a Zoom again, somewhere, right? Maybe, <clears throat> I don't know if we, <laughs> if, I guess we could open it up first. If we all have a sense of urgency, we're freaking out in about two weeks and we need to get together, that could be a, an opportunity. But if not, maybe we do it, you know, kind of right there at the end of August to bring us back together. But if we do that, we also maybe uh, create a little bit of some agenda items on some of the other topics that we traditionally had to try to help us work through some things. So uh, does that make sense to everybody? See a lot of head nods. Okay. And also, you know, I, I know that in my email, when Jasmine sent something out, um, I know I may be missing somebody. I don't know if we've got all the charters. I don't know if we've got all the private school folks. I know that some of the, the names have changed the positions. So please uh, forward things out. Keith will uh, share this recording um, through Jasmine, I suppose, so that you all can forward it to your own staff members. I think one of the most valuable things that could come from today is steal the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> I thought some of the PowerPoint slides would be great to share in, in some public meetings or some staff meetings that you might have. So we will uh, get that to you a, a little bit later. And uh, again, wanna thank Keith for helping get this organized. Um, I wanna say good luck to everybody, okay? Uh, with everything you're dealing with and, and you know, hey, we are all together, okay? Uh, we're all gonna get through this together and, and uh, appreciate you know, all my friends uh, here. So thank you all uh, for joining us and hope you all go get to have some sort of weekend, okay? <laughs>